Hello everybody, welcome back. Thank you for all the kind comments. In the last video we used our custom knives to run the rails and styles for our custom kitchen doors. In this video we're going to raise the solid maple panel. So let's take a look at the cutter head we're going to use for that as well as the knives. Okay, so the panel razor we are going to use today is also by Whitehill Tools. This is the smaller of the two limiter style panel razors that they offer. Now, a little while ago a friend of mine bought the larger version of this and while I had it here in the shop, I did a video comparing the two of them. And what I'll do is I'll put a link to that video in the description to this video. Whitehill offers three different kinds of panel razors. Two limiter style like this one. And, uh, and another one that takes uh, carbide inserts. It's also a chip limiting design of cutter head. But it just uses the body to affect the chip limitation instead of using separate limiters. But this is a smaller cutter head and it has done everything that I need to do. Now you can refer to the other video for all the details, but these blocks are made to be run either over top of or underneath the block depending on your preference. And you notice the slots are labeled under and over. This tells you where to put the knife depending on how you're running the block. Now I had these knives ground to be run underneath the stock, so we're going to put our cutters in the under slot. <laughs> And we're all prepared to finish preparing our stock and head up to the big shop. Okay, so we're up here in the big shop with the big machine. Uh, this is a lovely old Wadkin EQ spindle molder, if any of you are interested. So uh, let's get this set up to run the raised panel. So I'm going to take this uh, auxiliary fence off here just for now because it will be in the way. Now, as I said before, we are running this underneath the stock in a counterclockwise direction. So we'll set it on there like that. Now there are a number of different ways to do it and there are arguments for, um, for how to go about it. A lot of people like to run it over the top of the stock because it makes for uh, a more uniform tongue thickness for, for sitting in the grooves in your rails and styles. Uh, but this one, since we're doing a back relief anyway, in order to, to size it down to the size of the grooves, uh, it doesn't really matter. And um, in some ways, it's a little bit more straightforward. It's a little safer to be running underneath the stock. Now, setting these blocks up is relatively straightforward. But in this situation, much like we're doing the rails and style profile, we have a sample from an earlier run, which will make this a lot easier. I keep samples of all my profiles. Not only is it a lot easier to visualize the products they produce, but you can also use it to show clients. It's very handy for setups like this. These adjustable fence bars are an excellent upgrade to a traditional shaper fence, especially with profiles like this where you aren't removing the entire edge of the stock. The bar is simply adjusted to the height of the unmilled portion of the component, allowing it to safely traverse the gap between the fence plates. In adjusting the power feeder, I want to make sure that the wheels are completely parallel to the shaper bed. I also want to tow them in slightly towards the fence just to make sure the component is pushed up against the fence along its entire route past the cutter head. One thing I want to point out quickly that's really nice about this limiter style cutter head is that more often than other styles of cutter heads, you can do this with other styles as well, but it uh, seems more often with this limiter style of cutter head, it's easy to just turn the cutter head sideways and do a dry run with the machine off just to make sure your power feeder is behaving the way you want it to. Uh, it's a really nice feature to be able to do that. Now it should be noted before I run this that this power feeder normally, and all power feeders would normally have a guard over top of the wheels. Uh, mine came loose the other day and uh, I just have it down at the other shop uh, working, but normally I would not run this without the guard. So let's test this, just make sure it's working properly. That's great, no problems at all.
What I'm running here is an extra panel that I glued up. It'll serve not only as a test piece to confirm settings, but it'll also go into a completed door that I'll keep around for future reference and to show clients. Everything is fine, so I moved right on to our project panels. You notice it looks like I'm only running the end grain and it looks like only one panel, but it's actually two panels glued up together. I did it this way because individually the panels are very narrow and it would have been dangerous to try and run the short side end grain against the cutter block. Once the ends were all profiled, I ripped them to width on the table saw and then ran the long side. You can build jigs and fixtures to, to secure them properly so that you can run them individually on the short side, but this approach is very straightforward, safe and simple. Okay, so as you can see, everything turned out great. Now it's time to put the back bevel on these panels so that they fit in the grooves. Now, it should be pointed out that you can stack cutter heads if you have a big enough machine to do that, and you can do the front and the back at the same time. But for the sake of this sort of simplistic approach to it, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the, the smaller machine to put the recess in the back. Now, what we can do is we can simply use the rebate function of the combi head to do that if we want. But what I'm going to do instead is I have a, a cutter that I used on another job that will put in a nice gentle cove at the same time as recessing the back. So let's set the cutter head and the machine up for that and uh, get to it. With this small machine there isn't room to drop the block down below the table to give me access to the portion of the knife I wanted to use. This meant I had to run the block backwards and above the stock. Okay, well that about wraps up the milling portion of these raised panels and as you can see the results are excellent. So what I'll do from here on out is I will sand the flat portion on the front and the back of these panels maybe relieve some of the crisp edges. But as you can tell the milled portion or the profiled portion of these panels are excellent. They don't need any sanding whatsoever. Then what I'll do is I'll finish the entire panel before gluing up the doors. But before I finish the rails and styles, what I'll do is I'll run that small cove on the back of the rails and styles. Then I'll sand everything, finish it all up, package it and send it off to the clients. If you like these last couple of videos, please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe. If you're interested in receiving a notification that the next video is out, go ahead and hit the little bell button beside the subscribe button and you'll get a notification in your inbox that a new video has been posted. Speaking of new videos, what we have coming up is an interesting project. We've got a little sneak preview behind me here. This is a roughly 33 by 19 inch piece of solid white pine. This is not a glue up. This has uh, some pretty serious sentimental value to a client of mine. And I've been tasked with the job of turning this into a table without cutting it at all. So if you enjoyed the shaper or spindle molder content of the last couple of videos, there will be some more and some different type of work coming up as I work my way through this project. We are going to use the shaper to form tenons on the undercarriage components 
for this table. So I will be video documenting that build as well. So stick around. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time.